tomorrow night, uh, tomorrow night is going to be very special because everybody that's going to come to the service is going to see a vision or hear Jesus' voice. But, <laughs> and, I'm not, and I'm not trying to put honey in your mouth. That's the, this is the reality. This is what's going to happen. Because the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit showed me, uh, the Holy Spirit showed me a, a, a very simple way to lead the church into the presence of Jesus and to meet with Him. We did it yesterday with Jeremiah Johnson. One lady was healed from thyroid problems because Jesus touched her right there. One lady was set free of fear. Everybody saw visions. Everybody heard Jesus' voice. Woo! So, I'm excited because, can I tell you what? We are living in a time yes. that it's so important that you don't come to church and hear God's voice, but that you hear it out in the marketplace. Yes. And wherever you go, in your business, in your marriage, in your children's lives, in friends and family, in your calling, it is the most important thing in your life. Yes. Um, God, I, I think I, I read it a little bit different here. God is a relationship, God. And how can you be in a relationship if you never hear someone's voice? That's, right, right. that's just ridiculous. Right. You know, and this is what I'm going to talk about. So tonight I'm going to lay a foundation, if that's fine with you guys. And then tomorrow night we're going to go deeper into it. Amen. I'm going to use a lot of illustrations and stuff and things that God has said to me over the years. Tomorrow night I'm going to speak on we live from the overflow of what we hear. I'm, I'm 27 years in ministry and I am functioning on a word that God gave me 27 years ago. <laughs> that word is overflowing continuously. And uh, that doesn't mean that God can speak to me in 27 years. I'm Living now on other things, and I'm exactly at another place in my life that I really need to hear Jesus for the next, next phase. So that's it, okay? So tomorrow night's going to be awesome. Tonight's going to be awesome too because I'm going to talk about some other things. But first of all, I just want to say I'm blessed to be with you guys. I want to say to the youth, you guys are doing an awesome job with that song. Was singing there. Amen. And it's good to be with you guys. I was on the road the whole day and uh, I was thinking a lot and talking a lot to the Lord and uh, I'm just excited. So I'm going to start off here. First of all, I want to tell you I don't have my glasses. I forgot it in the hotel room. So, <laughs> do you guys put scriptures up there? Yes. You do? Hallelujah. <laughs> I, just, I just hope you're not going to put old King Jimmy on there. <laughs> if you can just put on something like New King James Version or New, New American Standard Brother, that would be awesome. But, uh, uh, it seems like I don't even have my message with me. I don't even have my message with me. <laughs> Grace. 
And it's absolutely, you can't function in the new covenant without the Holy Spirit. Amen. How many of you agree with me that the church was birthed by the Holy Spirit? Amen. That's how everything started. Amen. You can't live this Christian life without the Holy Spirit. He's the one that reveals everything. He's the one that opens up the scriptures. He's the one that shows us God. He's the one that do the born again experience in us in everything. We can't, uh, we can't just go on knowledge. I've discovered in the grace move, there's a big problem that many people just, oh, I got an avenue revelation. Hey guys, let me tell you what, if I don't see signs, wonders and miracles and healings and the power of God in our meetings, then somewhere we miss it. Because guys come up and they teach a teaching and they don't prophesy, they don't minister to people, they don't uh, encourage the church, they don't help the church to come into the gifts of the Spirit. And if we can't do that, then we're somewhere in this whole calling of us, we miss God. Yeah. Okay. So here's, here's, what, here's what the Holy Spirit told me. I said one day, I said to the Holy Spirit, how do I know when I'm full of you? Because you say that you will make it. I said, how will I know I'm full of the Holy Spirit? You know what he said to me? If you can see Jesus in His fullness in you, you are full. Oh, here's the word that I use, say see. see. See, that's where we must see. Tonight I want to talk about seeing in the Spirit. Say see. see. God wants to open the eyes of your heart. God wants to open everything up so that you can understand things. Because faith, there's something that people miss with faith. Can I tell you what is that? See, how many of you come out of a word of faith background and I'm not judging it? I was also in a word of faith background. And the problem that I had in the word of faith background was that we continuously hear faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. Have you, <laughs> have, have you seen that? that? Faith comes by hearing. And, and you know what, I, I had a problem with it because here's the reality, that is only how faith come to you. That's only how it come to you. It doesn't mean that you're going to receive it. It doesn't mean that it's going to take reality in your life. It also can mean that it can slide by you. Faith come to you so somewhere in this whole picture you need to understand what faith is. So, we preach grace and we say, what we preach about grace is, is we, we all know that we are saved by grace through faith. Okay, so grace stirred faith in me. Are you still with me? We are saved by grace through faith. So, faith is more than just trust. <laughs> Faith is much, much more than just believing in God. And that's what I want to open up for you tonight. Can I do that? Because it's just another, not another, it's just a real slam, slam on what faith really is. Because it's like uh, 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 Bill said to me this afternoon, when you understand grace, when you've got the revelation of grace, then you can put the dots together, then you can bring everything together. If you, if, you, if you don't have the revelation of grace, you basically will never understand the Bible. It will always be like a mystery to you. Since I understand grace, there's a lot of things in the Bible that just become clear to me, like on discipline, on, you know, I always thought God disciplined me and, I, and things like that. And then God began to show me the reality concerning it. So, what is faith really? The Bible says faith comes by hearing the Word. Okay, that's only how it comes to you. So if faith comes to you, then faith is more than just hearing. It's, it's something deeper. It's something more a reality that you can walk by. Amen. If faith hits you, then something will happen with you. Let me give you a good illustration. Um, each one of us have a calling in the body of Christ. I remember in, in, in South Africa, um, uh, uh, we have lots of snakes in, in South Africa. I don't know, do you guys have snakes yet? What kind of snakes do you have? <laughs> uh, huh? Is that poisonous, Papa Man? Thank God you told me about that. Um, Canada, we have snakes, but not one of them are poisonous. 
But talk about snakes. You know what is interesting? God talked to you all the time. Do you know that? This summer, I would come into my backyard and I would have a vision of a python snake. And then I thought, what is this? It's like every time I come in my backyard, I have a vision. I go to my wife and I say, this is ridiculous. There's not even python snakes in Canada. Are you, are you with me? And, and I just, every time I come in my backyard, I'm like as if I'm careful. And I have this vision of a snake. And I'm almost like something say to me, yes, a snake. My goodness me, you know what happened? A couple of weeks after that, the neighbors call in the wildlife. They found a nine feet python snake in, in, in the backyard of the neighbors. It is someone who had a python snake in the thing got, got lost. And God said to me, can you see that I talk to you all the time? And God actually told me that I passed by that snake several times and I didn't know him. Yeah. Woo! It's one of my cats that I really wanted to disappear and he didn't disappear. <laughs> God forgive me for that. But, but, but God speaking. But, but here's what I saw in South, in South Africa. Here's what I saw. One night the snake was in our falling down our swimming pool. And now it's a situation because the things swim all around and you can't get out. And I had three dogs. And I know all of them are stupid when it comes to snakes because they are not field dogs. They are always in the yard. They are always kept. They know nothing about snakes. So we try to keep the dogs away. The like snakes don't bite them. But we have one dog, and it, uh, her name was Sandy, and she was a Staffordshire dog. And, 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 and while I was struggling, the next moment Sandy came in and she grabbed that snake at the right moment, right behind his neck, pull him out of the water, and break him in three pieces. Woo! And I stand there shocked. And I look at it, and you know what God spoke to me, and God said to me, did you know that that dog is programmed to do that? Yeah. Never seen, never, never encounter a snake in her life before. Never ever. And in a moment she did it. And God said to me, this is what God said to me, when my spirit come into you, I've given you a specific gift that when you encounter your calling, that gift will begin to manifest. Yes. You understand? Like, for instance, let me give you a good illustration. I was stage frightening when I was a kid. I, uh, I remember once they asked us to speak in, they asked me to speak in a de debate. Did you say debate or debate? 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 In a debate. And I remember I was, I think I was, I was 10 seconds on the stage and I basically ran off the stage. I was stage fright. I was absolutely frightening of it. When I was born again, I was called to ministry. I was always fearful of the reality of speaking. Until my pastor asked me to give me my testimony. I didn't sleep for nights. I fasted and prayed because I know this is just hell on earth. But that morning when I came into the pulpit, I begin to cry and it was almost like I cry all the rejection out of me and I begin to preach. Like I've never preached in my life before and I walk out and I said, God, what was that? He said, I've placed the gift in you. Amen. Tonight I want to tell you there's a gift inside of you. And if you sit around just in the church, okay, Pastor, you're going to do something for us today to impress us here. You're never going to find it. It's when you really walk into something that you encounter something in life that gift come loose. Are you with me? Your neighbor can be sick, a brother at work basically maybe need Jesus. Are you with me? And you walk into that and in that moment the gift is released in you. Hallelujah. Someone maybe need a word in, in the desperate. We need to become sensitive to the Spirit of God. We need to become more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the world or the world, the world that we are created from is bigger and greater than this world that we are living in. We have been born from another dimension where God the Father is, where Jesus the mediator of the new covenant is, the Holy Spirit, thousands upon thousands of angels, the city of God, the mountain of God. There's a world out there that is not temporary but eternal. And this what we are living in is temporary, but that world can bring change into this world that we are living in. And the only way that God's going to do it is through you. People pray and say, God, come and visit the city. Can I tell you something? God has already visited Pineville in this place tonight. Wherever you walk in Pineville, there is God. Isn't that awesome? Yes. 
And I want to encourage you tonight by seeing and hearing God's voice. And I want to begin by seeing, can we do that? So we talk about the gospel and we talk about faith. Faith only comes to you. Say gospel. When we, brother, can you put up for me there Romans uh, to, uh, 10 and we put up verse four, uh, 14, 15 and 16 and 17 because that's what we are used to when we talk about faith. Amen. I want to show you something tonight. Can I do that? Woo! Yes. I, I, I will just, just bless me because tonight I am in the midst of spirits of men and women made perfect. Thank you for your enthusiasm. You may sit down. Verse 14 he says, how, but, how are the, the, uh, but how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed in? How are they to believe in him, in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Now verse 15 says, and how are they to preach unless they are sent, as it is written? How beautiful is the feet of those who preach good news. Say good news. Yes. Verse 16 says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel for Isaiah, said Lord, who is believed what he has heard from us. Verse 17 says, so faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, of the word of Christ. That's the real translation is the word of Christ. So what I want to say to you here tonight is that word there is rhema. We all, we all say rhema in the past. That's when we talk about the living word of God. But can I tell you something? That's, we have missed something in that passage. The word that we talk about there is the good news of Jesus Christ. If it's not good news, it will never be rhema. It will never be alive. Because good news, here's something that you need to really understand tonight, is that news is always past tense. Yeah. If you read the newspaper today, it tells you about something that happened yesterday. Isn't that true? Yeah. When I preach the good news to you, I tell you about what Jesus has already done. Good news got nothing to do with the future. It's right now a reality of what Christ has already done for us. Yeah. But it doesn't stop there because... This, me and you can look at the cross and we can look at the resurrection and we can look at the ascension and we can see Jesus seated on the right hand of the Father. But it is not faith in reality. Because many people today, the religious churches in this community all over the world believe that Jesus died. They believe that He's risen from the dead and they believe that He's seated on the right hand of the Father. There's something different in faith that me and you need to capture tonight. That is really important. Can we do that? Yeah. So the next scripture that I want you to take me to is Hebrews 10 verse 1. <clears throat> and I want to show you something here because this is so awesome. We, uh, uh, oh man, when the Father begins to take me into this stuff, I just He says, for since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come. Say good things. Good things. Instead of the, the true form of these realities. Now, the New King James Version, it's according to me, the true. That, I believe Jesus wrote the New King James Version. So, <laughs> that, that's just what I said. But the New King James Version says, it is the image of the things coming. Say image. So the law is a shadow of the things to come, but not the very image of the things. Image is the really important thing that you need to see here tonight. Say image. Yes. So if we go now to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and we go and we go from verse 1 and I want to read through there. I want to show you something. Say gospel. Gospel. You read? Okay, sorry brother. Let's first go to 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Because you need to see this. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Okay. Can we go to the last two verses of 2 Corinthians 4? The last two verses there. <laughs> I really I really put a lot of pressure on you tonight. <laughs> Don't worry, take your time. <laughs> we got time. He said, For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all compassion. Verse 18, comparison, excuse me. As we look not now, yes, come reality. As we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are unseen. You still with me? For the things that are seen are transient or temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Yeah. Hallelujah. Okay, so yes, here is a 
is an unseen world. So it says there is a world that is temporary that we can see and there is a world that is unseen that is eternal. Yeah. So if we say we walk by faith and not by sight, then they actually say we walk by the unseen world. Yeah. It's still worth it. Yeah. Now we go to 2 Corinthians 4 and we look at verse from verse 1 and we read it there. And I, and, I, and I just want to, then I'm going to take it from there. Like I want to lay a foundation. Therefore having this ministry by the mercy of God. Now he's talking about the new covenant, but the covenant. We do not lose heart. It's really important that you see the word. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to temper of God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Verse 3. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Just stop there. Don't go on. Okay, let's read that. In the case, in there, uh, yes, let's stop there. That's good. And even if our gospel is veiled, go back to 3. <laughs> even if our gospel is veiled to those who are perishing. Now, here's what I want to say to you. Remember Hebrews 10 says that, that the law is the shadow of the things and but not the very image of things, because that's very important that you keep that in your mind now. Yes, All right, say image, amen. because the next verse is going to reveal it to you. So let's go to verse 4 now. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing, now listen to this, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Okay, let's go back to you. You don't have to turn that, but if I remind you now of Romans, it says faith comes by hearing and hearing the yes. word of God. And I said to you, that word is the gospel that is being preached. So faith, this is what the gospel does. And this is how faith works. The gospel reveals to the born again believer the image of Christ in him. Okay, you still with me? Because... When I preach the gospel, I am revealing to you who you are in Christ. Amen. I am revealing to you Christ in you, and I connect you to an unseen world. Yeah. So faith, so if I walk by faith and not by sight, then I walk by seeing Jesus Christ all the time in me. Yeah. Listen, this new covenant, is, this is the reality of the new covenant. If you can't understand this, the new covenant is about Christ in us, the hope of glory. The new covenant is about God come and take residence in man. The new covenant got nothing to do with people praying for God to come. God has already arrived. God has taken residence in man. So what needs to happen with us? There's something that needs to happen with us. The eyes of our heart needs to open that we are conscious all the time of Christ in us. I'm all the time conscious of God in me. I see Jesus all the time in me. I am, my, my flesh man become less and less and less and less in me because I'm conscious of Christ in me. When you come to that place, you're going to be surprised what things that can happen. Let me give you a good illustration. One night I was staying in Pizza Hut. How many of you know when you're in Pizza Hut, you've got one thing on your mind? Pizza. I'm going to get that pizza now, and I already work on my toppings. Yes. Do you say the same word? Yes. Because i got special toppings, so I, I'm working on my toppings now. You don't bother with me now. So if you talk to me, if you talk to me in the pizza line, you don't talk to me about other stuff. You talk to me about pizza, yeah. because this is where I am now. This is what I'm going to get. I like my pizza. Amen. Amen. So while I stand one night in, in Pizza Hut, the next moment, he, I look at this woman. She was standing in the queue next to us, in the lineup next to us. I look, when I look at her, I just see this words in the spirit, the boss. Just like that, all over. And I look at her, this is weird. And I look at my, my own business. And I know it's the Holy Spirit talking to me. So I look again, I see it again. I said, come on, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do? Go and walk up to her and tell her, hey, are you divorced? I mean, I don't even know. You know, what, what do you want me to do? I mean, this is ridiculous. The Holy Spirit says, I just know in me, you have to make connection with that woman right now. 
and I just stand around, I stand around, I, I try to think of other stuff and, and every time I look at this woman, it's just divorce is written all over her. And I stand around and eventually I begin to just talk to her. I say, how are you doing? She says, no good. I say, you know, it's so awesome. I begin to just talk nonsense about pictures and stuff, you know, and things. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and eventually it just popped out of my mouth. I said, are you divorced? She began to cry right there. Tears begin to come out of over her face. And I and I look at her and I and I say, sorry, honey, I, I didn't mean to hurt you. She says, How do you know? I said, I didn't know. God just showed me. She said to me, Well, I'm in the middle of a divorce. And it's a horrible situation that I'm in. I said, Well, if God showed me this, then he definitely wants to do something about it. Yes. See, that's the church in the marketplace. Yes. Are you with me? That woman and her husband is restored today. <laughs> Jesus wants to do that with everybody. In this, did you know that people in your community, I don't care if they got the best cars and the most beautiful home, if they don't know Jesus Christ tonight when they go to bed, they are thinking of deep issues and problems that you don't know about. Because every person that's outside of Jesus Christ have a huge problem. Oh, yeah. Doesn't matter what it is. Amen. They are either empty. Yeah. We, the suicide rate in the world is oh, increasing. Oh, yeah. Problems is increasing all over. Can I tell you something? This is now the time that the church have to hear God's voice. Not for ourselves. It's good if God tell me things for myself. Yeah. But you know what? It's time for us to begin to see in the spirit. And you think... Well, when will God use me? Can I tell you something? God is already busy with you. Yes, yes. God is already working behind the scenes. If God says something to you about anybody, wow. you know what God, I say to people, you know what God don't say much? God can say, get your passports ready. That's all that they have to say. Oh, when he say that, then he is already busy getting stuff ready. Are you with me? That's why I say God is a man. You don't say much. That's a joke. <laughs> I'm not making enemies here. Are you getting it? Are you getting it? Is that God wants you to see in the spirit? Yes. See, faith is not faith unless me and you can see in the spirit. Faith only comes by hearing. See, if you see it, you got it. <laughs> if you can see it, you have it. Okay, I'm going to say it again. If you can see it, then it means you have it. If you, and everything begins with this one thing, that you can see Jesus Christ inside of you. If you can see that, then everything from, will escalate from there. Now lately, there is, is a problem in the body of Christ. I mean, there's lots of problems in the body of Christ, but... There's one problem in the body of Christ that concerns me in the grace move, and that is that there is certain, certain preachers lately that begin to say, God gives you grace to obey the law. That's ridiculous. Because if God gives me grace to obey the law, then something is wrong in this picture, because Jesus Christ is the end of the law. Are you still with me? Because grace and law is opposites of one another. And, th and that's the problem. The, the only reason why you can't see in the spirit is because somewhere still in your belief system is the influence of the law. It's the only reason why you don't see. Because the Bible says until this day if Moses is read, there is a veil on the heart. So if you can't see in the spirit, then somewhere you are still influenced by the law. Are you with me? So if I say God give you grace to obey the law, there's something wrong because they take Hebrews 10 and they talk about Hebrews 10 and they say in Hebrews 10, they say that God said that this is the covenant He will make. He will put His laws in, his, in our heart and write in our mind and He will not remember our sins anymore. That law is not the law of Moses. It's the law of God. So how many of you know that there is the law of Moses, 
There is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. There is the perfect law of liberty in James. So the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is a very powerful because the law always has a powerful effect on your life. It doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. So the law of Moses will never ever, the only thing that the law of Moses does is to impart sin. It's the only thing that it does because it's the knowledge of sin. How many of you agree with me on that? Your pastor probably preached that yet. It's the knowledge of sin. It, it, the law will never say anything good about you. It will only point out your weaknesses. But here's the reality is that Jesus brought an end to that law. There is no more law that can point to you and tell you you are a sinner. So it's ridiculous to say give me grace to obey the law. That law has been done away with. It does not exist. But there is two other laws that is really powerful that both come out of the light of Jesus Christ. That comes out of the image of Jesus Christ. The first one is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that have set me free of sin and death. Yeah. In Romans 8. Now what is amazing about that scripture is that you compare it to the born again experience. Because when I'm born again, when I accept the Lord, when I focus on Jesus and I say, Jesus, I believe in you. And I believe that you are risen from the dead. And I believe that you pay for my sins personally. Then that law becomes in effect in that moment. And what it does is it drives the spirit of sin and death out of me, which is my sin nature. And it drives into me the life of God Hallelujah. that sets me free. See, I can take tonight, I don't want to take your Bible, but I, of your mind, but I will take my Bible. We know the law of gravity. It's simple. When I lose it, it goes down. You can do nothing about it. You stand on a big building. And you try to fly, believe me, you're going to splat on the ground, it's over. That's, that's how the law of gravity works. But you can take a little birdie and you hold him in your hand. And that's exactly what the law does. Is that uh, the law, if you are a child of God, you are like a bird that's in the hands of something that holds you. But if you release that bird, then the life that's in that bird makes you fly out. That's good. Are you with me? And there is life in you that raise you above the gravity of this world that raise you above the gravity of the law that wants to pull you down and that life is like the the life of in a bird you begin to spread your wings and you come out and you come into your freedom so that's the first thing that happened with your life the second thing that happened in your life now the law the perfect law of liberty begins to work now because the perfect law of liberty is in james 2 Excuse me, that's one where he says, he who looks into the mirror and forget what kind of man he is. What kind of man? Say kind of man. What kind of woman? He is like a man who looks into, who is not the doer of the word. Did you know that? Oh, let me start all over again. Brother, put that scripture out for us there in James 1. Because this is now, I, I'm out of the words here. I don't have my, my notes. I'm doing good so far. <laughs> <laughs> it's really the Holy Spirit it's better than, than me. Which verse? What is there? Well, basically on the end of James, um, I probably have to pick up my Bible. I think it's 118, Does it mean anything to you guys so far? Amen. Yes. So faith, faith, to walk in faith is to see Christ in you. That's the beginning of it all. Okay. It's 23 and 24. Oh, it's 23 and 24. 24 that is. Begin in verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, can I tell you what? Go and check that word out in the Greek doer. It's a very powerful word. That word refers to the finished work of Jesus Christ. In the, in the original Greek. It does not refer to you doing something. It is you relying on what he has already done. It's so powerful. He said, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. Verse 24. For he looks himself and goes away and forgets what he was like or what kind of man he was. Verse 25 says, but then he who looks into the perfect law of liberty... Oh, that is so powerful. Because what is the perfect law of liberty? 
The perfect law of liberty is Jesus Christ himself. Hallelujah. He's the perfect man that come and live inside of you. You've been created in perfection. For by one offering he has perfected those who are sanctified. Hebrews 10 verse 14. Say I'm perfected. You have a perfect spirit in Jesus of liberty because the, 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 the spirit of Christ that is in you will never ever point to your sin. It will never ever show any weakness. It will never condemn you. It will never brought you down. It will only point to one thing. Your righteousness. Your perfection that you had in Christ. Are you with me? It will only point to the mercy and the grace that you have received in Jesus Christ. Of liberty. And it liberates us. So that's so that's why God don't give you grace to obey the law. No, the grace of God that is inside of you is the very image of Christ because the grace of God is Jesus Christ Himself. Yes. He's a person. Yeah. Grace is a person. And He dwells inside of me. Yeah. And now, by grace I've been saved. That means that Jesus come and live in me through faith. So now my faith is seeing all the time the image of Christ in me. And I've been created in the image of my Papa Father. Woo! And yet the reality, I'm a son of God and I'm inseparable from His presence. I'm inseparable from His love. Right now you are, in, right now you are connected. You are inseparable from an unseen world that is more powerful than this world. When that thing come and manifest through you, please don't say, oh, I don't believe that. Say, yes, I believe that. Yeah. Did you know that miracles are supposed to be very normal for us? Yes. Did you know that healings are supposed to be very yes. normal for us? Yes. Yes. It must be like, it must be like almost second nature for us. Because if the blind see, we begin to jump around and scream, and then it's like the, the biggest thing that happened. It's true. It is something very big that happened when a blind person sees. But you know what? For us, it must supposed to be like normal. Are you with me? It is, it, 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 there is no difference for someone being healed from a flu and a blind person. There's no difference. It's just we look at, the, we look at that which is temporary and we think, wow, this is a little bit way out because we are limiting God in our own hearts. And you are limiting God as you don't see Jesus in you. But if you see the very man. See, if I look at Christ in me, uh, there is a man dwelling in me that walked on the water. The same man that walked on the water, healed the sick, multiplied the bread. He's living inside of us. Amen. Is, is you with me here in this yeah. See, God told me something. He said, Peter, I want you to stop thinking. <laughs> you think too much. <laughs> Renewing of the mind basically means to stop thinking. It's really the truth because his, his mind begins to work in us. Yeah. And if the mind of Christ is in us, that, then it means we have a mind yeah. that is not from this world. We have a mind that is in line with the finished work of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. So, I... I, I <laughs> The, the wonderful thing of this all is, is that people think when Jesus sat down on the right hand of the Father, the work was finished. No, the work is finished the moment that you believe is living in you. Yeah. That's the finished work of Jesus Christ. When the believer begins to believe that Christ in His fullness come and live in us. The Bible says in Colossians 2, 9 and 10, it says that the fullness of the God that dwells in Him bodily, and you are complete in Him. I have a friend in South Africa. I learned a lot from him. He's a very strong prophet. I don't know if I told you the story last year when I was here about the face that come out of the man. Did I tell you that? Anyway, he, he, he can really hear God's voice. He's really, really sensitive to the voice of God. But anyway, one day the Lord said to him, I want you to go to a nightclub, a specific nightclub in his city. He says, Lord, I can't go there. It's one of the roughest places in this town. You know, and I'm a pastor, I, I can't just walk in there, it's probably some of the young people that know me here, I sit in, in this rough place, you know. And the Lord says, no, you need to go there. And he, he pondered on that for days. And then eventually he phoned two of his elders in the church, he said, boys, you want to go with me down to that club? And they said, they said, pastor, are you crazy? He said, no, God told me to go there and I need to take some other guys with me. I mean, I, I can't just walk in there on my own, you know, I need, I 
many people with me. So, so they they went with him very reluctant, but they went with him. The pastor say he, God told him to go there. They said, what are we going to do there? They said, I don't know. When we arrive there, God will probably going to do something. Can you see what's going on here? Can do you think you can hear God's voice like that? Oh yeah. You can. And he he walk in there, and the amazing thing is, <laughs> he sat down, and the waiter came up, a young girl, and she began to serve them, and um, she talked to the two elders, and when he looked at her, those words come out of his mouth. He said, Jesus loves you. And she turned around and ran. And the two elders, they said to him, Pastor, a bright, shining face came out of you when you say it and went back. People, when I hear stuff like that, I yeah. begin to... <laughs> <laughs> they saw it with their own eyes. And he says, well, Lord, thank you for frightening the girl. <laughs> I mean, now, so they finish their coffee and they walk out of the club. And when they walk out of the club, she was standing outside. She gave her uniform in. And she says, I'm a bachelor Christian. I don't know if you can use the word bachelor, but like the prodigal. And she says, I saw Jesus coming right out of you. Yes. And I believe God wants to help me. Please help me. Oh, Come on, people. Yeah. There's, a, there's, a word. Then there's something in you that's bigger than yourself. Hey. And we just yeah. need to, we need to just pass by ourselves. And we need to begin to see that there is something very great in us. Amen. Amen. God, you know, there is times that, that, that we think, See, God can speak to you and work through you when you are in your worst case scenario. There was times when I was at the worst of my worst that God uses me. Did you know that? That, I, that I'm cranky, that I'm upset with my wife, and then people phone me and say, we need ministry. And then I, then I sit there and I say, then I thought to myself, gee, I should have not get upset with my wife. I shouldn't have been cranky today. Now these people need ministry. I've got nothing. But you know, it's a lie. It's a lie. It's not that I've got nothing. God is still on. I may be off, but God is on. God is all the time on. You understand what I'm saying to you? I was in Brazil, and, and the last day that we leave, we were going to get on the bus. I'm so happy because for 10, 10 days, we have been ministering non-stop. You know, if you minister in Brazil, it's a different ball game. Everybody wants prayer. And we don't talk about 100 people. We talk about thousands of people that's coming out of the crowd. And I was just tired and so tired. And I just want to get on the bus, get a home, get on the plane and fly home and just have some couching time, you know, lie on the couch. That's all that I got in my mind. And they come up to me with this young girl and say, Pastor, will you please just pray for this girl? Oh my goodness. And I was like, okay, yeah, what does she need? You know, very arrogant. And they say, no, she got HIV and she's pregnant. And you know what? I had no faith. In myself. And you know what I did? I just lay my hands on her and I say, in the name of Jesus Christ, be healed. And I say, bless you, sister. That's all I can do. We're going to go home now. And I left a week later. I got an email out of Brazil. They said, she went for the first test. She's clean of HIV. And, I'm like, and then they, they came back with the second test because you have to go for a second test. Then they came back with the second test. And they said, she's completely completely clean and she was pregnant the next year when i went back to brazil she came with her baby to me her, a, a young born baby completely clean of hiv body oh, yeah. death. you know what she was shining like the sun that woman yeah. jesus touched her the church today is the answer to the world we are the most powerful move on oh, the yeah. earth we don't understand we don't come to knowledge of what is inside of us and I want to tell you something. You are in the right place with the right pastor. It's time to pay attention. It's yeah. time to begin to say, Jesus, if I don't have the desire, please put the desire in me that I get so hungry to see you move through me. That I open the eyes of my heart and I see you. Paul pray for the Ephesians and he say for them. And he said, I pray that God will give you a spirit of revelation in the knowledge of him that you will enlighten the eyes of your heart. That's what the New King James Version says. Amen? Amen? That you may know what is the hope of your calling, the glorious riches of the inheritance that we share in the saints. You have an inheritance. 
And then he said, the power that you work towards us, say us. When he rose from the dead and seated on the right hand of the Father. Well, did you know that when Jesus rose from the dead and sat right on the Father, he did it for the church. For us, towards us. That's what the Bible said. Yeah. We are the most powerful people on the earth. Yes. And we are not talking here about you doing anything or you getting into a fasting for, for 40 days. I'm sometimes ridiculous. I look at people and they come 40 days out of a fast and I ask them, what did God say to you? No, I was just sacrificing my life. And I thought, brother, you were on a hunger strike for 40 days. That's your problem. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Are you with me? You don't have to go into a fasting approach. I sometimes fast. I just fast to show the flesh that Jesus is boss, that's all. But I don't do it long because I begin to smell the pizza five miles away. Ah. <laughs> it's, like, it's unreal. Like, like, <laughs> what's his name? Steve McVeigh says, him and his friend says, Jesus, we are not going to eat until we let someone to you. And the next day they force a little boy in the park to make a commitment to Jesus. <laughs> and they ran for the first restaurant. But anyway, guys, it's, it's, it's a matter of just relaxing. Say relax. relax. And begin to focus on the finished work of Jesus. But the finished work of Jesus did not end at the cross. The finished work of Jesus ends inside of you. This is where it ends. This is where it comes to its fullness. This is where it comes complete. The day when you understand that the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Him bodily and I am complete in Him. Huh? You know, if you are in a religious community, you know what happened? You are constantly throwing stuff at you. There's an environment that you live in if you are in a religious community. It's a mindset that's in that community. Did you know that it brings an atmosphere? Did you know that in this place tonight, because of the worship, we are all excited, we worship God. Did you know that our spirits, as he explained tonight, create an atmosphere here? Yeah. Isn't it true? Yes. Did you know that the religious community, their mindset creates an atmosphere? That you sometimes walk in, in, in town or you are in a place and you don't know why you feel so horrible sometimes. sometimes. Yeah. You, that you feel that. Yeah. Say, Jesus, we had such an awesome day yesterday in the church. What's going on with me now? I suddenly feel horrible. Have you had that? People have an atmosphere. Yes. It's an atmosphere to death. <coughs> Paul talked about it's a fragrance to death. And a fragrance to life. But you know what? If you encounter that, don't give in to that. Recognize it immediately and say, hey, whoa, something bigger is in me. Immediately begin to focus inside. Because inside of you is the very life of God. Hallelujah. It's the very power of yes. God. It's not just life, it's eternal life. Yes. And it me, it's eternal life. It's the resurrection power of Jesus Christ that is dwelling in us. It, it, it's this this gospel is so beautiful. Yes. It is so it is God is so amazing that when you are in your worst place, God still loves you. God don't separate him from you. He cannot separate him from you. It's impossible to separate. Because if he separates himself from you, then it means Jesus has made a huge mistake on the cross. Amen. But the cross of Jesus Christ, keep that reality. The fact that Jesus is seated on the right hand of the Father, keep the reality that God will never ever leave you. So now I want to throw in this, can I kill a holy cow here tonight? Oh, please don't kill me. Can I do that? Can I do something? <laughs> well, I'm leaving in two days time and then Bill will explain. <laughs> But I want to give it to you and go and discuss it over a cup of tea with your friends. And say that guy from Africa is either an idiot or... You know. Here's what I want to say to you. Let's talk about intercession under the new covenant. How do you see intercession? What does it really mean? 
Is intercession something that we do? And we ask Jesus, or well, let me put it this way. If the Bible says Jesus make intercession for us to the Father, does that mean that Jesus Christ is every time when we make a mistake, then Jesus say to the Father, Oh, Peter, I've messed up again, but hallelujah, look at my wounds. He's free. Is that what it means? I don't think so. You know what intercession really means? It's ridiculous to think that Jesus will ask that of the Father. It's ridiculous to think that Jesus sitting on the right hand of the Father has to convince the Father of what He has done for us. Intercession is not for the Father, it's for you. The Holy Spirit, listen to this, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit do intercession for us. How does the Holy Spirit do intercession for us? Begging God to do something for us? No. no. He is pointing us to the cross and He shows you what Jesus has done for you. That's intercession. Intercession is Jesus seated on the right hand of the Father. It's not to convince the Father. No, it's to convince you that He has already done it. Oops, I'm walking here over the stuff. <laughs> Are you guys with me? Yeah. So we have done it. So the Bible says that we have to do prayers and intercessions for one another. What does that really mean? Does it mean that does it mean that I am coming into a position that I beg God no. to do something for my brother and sister? Because that's what they did under the old covenant. Moses came between. Because an intercessor is someone that come in between. Isn't that true? So Moses came in between the nation and God and he begged God not to kill them. But that's not what it means because intercession, when I pray for doing intercession for my brothers and sisters, I am asking the Holy Spirit to bring the whole work of intercession to a reality in that person's life by asking the Holy Spirit to give that person revelation knowledge of what he has in Christ. Because I can pray and pray and pray until I'm sick. But the reality is, is Paul's intercession was different than anybody else. He prayed for revelation knowledge. He prayed that God will do a work inside of people. That was different. Amen? Amen. Because many people in my life have prayed for that they were completely healed. And then afterwards they got their sickness back. Because they would just keep on living the life as if it's just, just life. But the problem is, is that they could have kept their healing if I could explain to them yeah. their, the revelation of Christ in them, the hope of glory. Are you guys with me? Yes, yes. So it's something to think about. So because in the, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit do intercession with groanings that is unspeakable. See, I used to say, and, and maybe you guys believe that. You know what? There's no problem with that if you believe it. It's fine with me. People used to say, well, that's that's the speaking in tongues. I don't think so. Because if you study the word groanings, the word groanings in the Greek basically means, in reality it means a deep emotion. Okay, let me bless you big time now. Can I do it? <laughs> Jesus groaned in Psalm 25, I think it says, I'm not sure, 23, 4, 25, 24 or 25. The Bible says that Jesus groaned and he says, Father, forgive them for, his, uh, excuse me, he says, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? The, the Hebrew literally say that, that he groans to the Father. He was really groaning, he had a deep emotion, and he asked God, why have you forsaken me? Woo! Put on your safety belt because here comes the reality. Yeah. I'm in the new covenant, say new covenant. New if I pull that thing out of the cross and I bring it into the new covenant, what does it mean? If the Holy Spirit groan in me with words that, is, that, is, that cannot be yeah. expressed, what does it mean? Because it says words that cannot be expressed, so it's, I'm not saying anything. I have a groan in me. And it's the Holy Spirit that makes that groan in me. What does the Holy Spirit really groan in me? Because it's a deep emotion that it brings to my heart. What is that emotion? If Jesus cried, Father, why have you forsaken me? Then now under the new covenant, what is the Holy Spirit bringing?
came to your heart. You are accepted with a deep groan. He came into your heart and he said, you are accepted. You are not forsaken. Hallelujah. Are you guys with me? <laughs> I just, just want to bless you with something here. Because what happened negative on the cross is positive in your life. I don't believe that the Father really forsake Jesus. I don't believe that. I believe, honestly, I believe that the Father has forsaken the Son of Man, but not the Son of God. Because on the cross, Jesus represents us as the Son of Man. But Jesus was God, was in Christ reconciling the world himself. So God did not forsake the Son of God. He never forsake. But he had to forsake the Son of Man, because every human being on this earth that don't know God thinks that God has forsaken him. So Jesus had to take that upon him. That's good. Yes. So it's tough to think that the wheels roll there, because that groaning that the Holy Spirit now brings to your heart, if you study that passage in Romans 8, you will see something incredible there. He says that, he says we are... In our weaknesses, we do not know what to pray. Say weakness. Oh, yes. come on. Yeah. Therefore, the Holy Spirit come with groanings, with words that cannot be uttered. So that if I have a weakness, then sometimes we as Christians come in a place that we are completely weak, that we feel like we are separated from God, that we have so much pressures that can be death in family, a loved one can be left to leave you. You can have financial problems, you can have a huge amount of problems, but if we are sensitive to the Holy Spirit and say to Him, help me, I'm weak, He can yeah. come with a groan, a deep emotion back into your heart, yeah. that cries, you are accepted. There's an emotion of love yeah. that floods your heart, that says to you, you're not forsaken. You're accepted. It's just something to think about because it bothers me every time when people begin to talk about groanings and stuff. But then I'm not saying that in a church service people cannot make sounds above me and that the sounds can come out of their spirit. I'm not, I'm not rejecting that. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? I'm not shutting that down because it's real. I hear people have, we call it groans. I don't know if it's a groan. It doesn't really happen to me before. But I've seen people go through stuff like that and they come out on the other side completely free and they have been touched by God. So I'm not throwing that out, but I can't call it the groaning of the Spirit. Yes. Are you with me? A groaning of the Spirit is a deep emotion of acceptance oh, that is yeah. coming to your heart. So tonight you sit here maybe and you feel like you are separated from God. And you feel like you maybe sit here tonight and you feel like, you feel like, I, Jesus, I just can't connect with you. Jesus, I just struggle with, with, with things in my life and there's so many issues in my life. But I pray Holy Spirit help me and the Holy Spirit will come into your heart with a groan of acceptance, a deep emotion of acceptance. <laughs> so Bill can fix it if you guys think I'm wrong. <laughs> but does it make sense to you? Yeah. Does it make sense to you? Because the new covenant to me, everything that happened under the old covenant has come into the new covenant and is real now. Amen. Bye-bye. Amen. So, the Holy Spirit, the first thing that the Holy Spirit wants to do for you to hear God's voice. He wants to open the eyes of your heart. And if, and if you don't, and if the eyes of your heart is not open, see that's faith, is that you, be, you walk by faith and not by sight. That means you begin to see in the Spirit. You hear in the Spirit. Did you know that God, 90% of the time, speaks by visions and dreams? 90%, I'm going to talk about that tomorrow now. 90% of the time, He speaks in visions and dreams. How many of you agree with me that when the Holy Spirit was poured out, then Peter stood up and he quoted what the prophet Joel said, and he said, this is that what the prophet Joel says. He said, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and they will prophesy 
they will see visions and they will dream dreams. And yes, that's the language of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can speak out of your spirit. The Holy Spirit can give you pictures. The Holy Spirit can show you something. He can speak to you in a dream. Did you know that many years ago, um, uh, <clears throat> whoa, yeah. it is like, I just came into the message of grace, it was in the 90s. I had a dream one night where I saw an arm with a passport. And in the dream, I hear these words, go to Lisbon. <laughs> I woke up out of my dream and I say to my wife, where in the world is Lisbon? I didn't even know where it was. She says, so I think it's in Portugal. So I went into the internet and I found, yes, it's the capital city. Of, 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 of Portugal. So I say to the Lord, if you want me to go to Lisbon, there is some... I want you to listen to this miraculous story. So I, we went to Brazil that year, as we go every year on our outreach, and the last day that I sit on the table, they put me with English people, English speaking people, because everybody speaks Portuguese in, Port in, in Brazil, so that I can at least have fellowship on the table where we sit and eat. And I said to the guys, guys, I want to tell you this amazing, I, this amazing dream. I believe that God wants to connect me with Portugal. And I said to them, uh, I, and I told them the dream. And the one guy said, hey, my mom and dad lives there. I can contact them and if you want to go, I can arrange it. You go there. And it wasn't long. I had an email from this guy. He said, my mom and dad said, you can come anytime and come and stay with them. I told the church this vision before I went to Brazil. One day a brother come to me and said, Pastor, you remember that vision that you told us about Brazil? Uh, uh, about Portugal? I said, yes. He says, God put in my heart to pay for you. Mm -hmm. So I took two other pastors with me and we went. And here I met this old man on the airport. <laughs> and I said, Jesus, I'm not so sure if this is your contact. But anyway, <laughs> we don't understand him. He don't speak one word. He leaves this man. He, he just... Talk to us, help us into the, his bus, and there we go, his little minivan. And we arrive at his home. He lives in an apartment. His wife do not understand one word English. And here we are, this, me and two other pastors in their home. And now I just wonder, okay, how is this going to come? To, I want to see how God is going to put this whole thing together. Guys, I tell you what. If God can do that for me, He can do that for you. Amen. So Sunday morning come the old man say, Vamos Iglesia, Vamos Iglesia, Vamos. And I stand there, we all look at him, what is he saying? So eventually he's on the phone, he talked to someone, and he told me to get on the phone, and it was a person who speaks English. And she said, no, he of a race, you preach at his church this morning. <laughs> oh, yeah. You guys must go with him, that's what it means, Vamos Iglesia means we are going to church this morning, that's what it means. So here we are with him on a train, and we went and we arrived at this church. And I preached there this morning. I got me interpreter. I meet the pastor. His name is Natalia. And the afternoon they had a baptism service. So it was just an old service. It was like as if things don't connect yet. I was like, and then the afternoon we had a, a baptism meeting, and all their churches over the country come with all the people that's going to be baptized. They do it at one place there. And the pastors and leaders came in. And I sit at the chair in a chair in one of the dead benches in this place. And next to me was a guy sitting who had a beautiful shirt on. And I said to my friends, this guy got a beautiful shirt on, I like his shirt. He said, yes, my uncle gave it to me. And he speak to me fluently in English. And that's when I met David Vincent. And he was the connection. And God take that guy from religion to grace. And that guy took it, man. And he got a church and called us the reina. He's just preaching. He's the only man in Portugal preaching grace. Can you believe that? But God had a plan. Can you see how things... It's, a, it's an awesome journey that we are on. And if we become... I want, you see, what I want to do is I want you... To begin to look inside. You see if the Bible says looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. It's not looking to something out there. It's seeing Him in you. Because He started the faith in you. He's going to finish in you. It's in you or outside of you. It's inside of us. 
this faith is inside of us. He's the author. He started it. He is the faith of God. He started in us. He's going to finish it. So the only thing that I want to do tonight is, uh, this group that is here, I want to bring the focus from yourself to Christ in you, who, which is the real you. Amen. The new creation. Image created in the image of Jesus Christ. And tomorrow night we take it from there. Because if you can see Christ in you, you become sensitive of the Spirit. Yes, yes. You become sensitive to the voice of God. Amen. Does it make you excited? Yeah. See, God, see, there's one man in the Bible that really, really, really impressed me. And you only heard of him once, and it's not even a big story. But he was the link to something very big. And you know what's his name? Ananias. Remember when Saul was knocked from his horse? There was a man, Ananias. If you look at the whole story, what's going on there, it's actually very incredible. Why is it incredible? It's incredible because Saul was a murderer. And he was taking the Christians to jail. Isn't that true? And God said to him, go and minister to that guy. Ah, you, you must be sensitive to God's voice, man. I mean, God said, go to Straight Street. The Saul, your brother Saul is waiting for you. And he says, Lord, he murdered the jail. He put the people in jail. I mean, can you imagine what went through his mind when he was walking through that, down that street? He was probably thinking, man, I miss God. I'm not so sure if this is God. He was a human being like us. I, I can just imagine. He probably was. It is like a, you are living in a Muslim community. And they are killing Christians. Are you with me? And God said to you, go to that guy, the, the very leader of them. And you have to go and minister to that guy. Come on. You better, you better be make sure this is God. Are you with me? That story so impacted me. Every time I look at it, and he arrived there, and yeah. he came, and he ministered to Paul, and he helped Paul into the reality. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think God can use you like that? Come on. Oh, yeah. Ananias, you never heard of him. I, he was not even an apostle. You never heard of this guy. This guy, you, he was not one of the 12 apostles. He was not one of the big anointed ones. He was just a man that was living in Damascus. Yeah. That is all. That knows God. That was having spending time of the Holy Spirit. And God said to me, go to the... It, don't you think it's amazing that you can have a relationship with God, give you the address of someone to go there and minister to that person? Yeah, yeah. We got to come to a place, the body of Christ. We got to come to that place. See, this challenges me. This is what challenges me about the kingdom of God. This, these kind of things. That is because this is where I, this is where you really see God work. So then, me and you have to definitely come to the place that we know this is God's voice and this is not God's voice. Yeah, boy. Amen. Mm -hmm. It's the discernment in the thing. I work with leaders all the time in, in, in our church setup that we are in. Because we have three full running churches and then two other that we are busy established. And I work with leaders and pastors all the time. I'm telling you, when you begin to work with leaders and pastors, you need discernment. I'm telling you. I can't just function with them with knowledge. It's a different ballgame. I really have to ask the Holy Spirit to give me wisdom and knowledge. Really, because it, they see things that you don't see. And they do things that you see, this is wrong, it's not going to work. And you need to come, you can't come and say to them, because this is grace now. You can't come and say to them, you're wrong, you, you do it this way. You have to come very gentle in and you have to tell them, listen, I, I believe this right, but you know what the Holy Spirit showed me? Why don't you think we tried this? It's almost like, I said to my wife the other day, I feel like a CIA agent. I feel like I feel like I'm watching them uh, working behind the scenes to know what's going on. But it's exciting, you know. I'm surprised how God will give me words of knowledge in situations. They come to me and they sometimes say to me, "True, Pastor, you got unbelievable wisdom." I don't have wisdom. I ask God to show me. Are you with me? They think they think I'm just like this guru with 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 all the wisdom and all the knowledge. Yes, you are 27 years in the ministry, man. You got it all. You got all the wisdom. It's a lie. It's not true. Every situation is different. 
you don't you think over 27 years you built up all the knowledge? You, every situation is different because we work with people. Every person is different. Every situation. Yeah. It is so important that yeah. you become sensitive to the voice of God. Really, yeah. it's absolutely important. There's nothing that blesses me more. Nothing that when you know what blesses me is the when the people in the church begin to see and begin to hear because that's this is why we are here we are here to equip you for the work of the ministry and you know what the main thing of the ministry is to hear God's voice that's the main thing of the ministry the main thing the main thing is to hear God's voice and to love on people that's what I've learned over the years people say to me what do you, what do you think is the main thing for ministry to work, I say there is only two things. Hear God's voice and love people. Finish. Nothing more. I'm going to tell you a last thing. Can I do that? I'm keeping you busy. It's Monday night. <laughs> I had a dream the other day. I dream I swim in this pond. Or this lake. I don't know the big lake. And I dream that. In the dream I know this is my lake. This is my pond. <laughs> I just know it's mine. Nice, beautiful, warm water. Swim. Something say to me, look under the water. So I look under the water, I see fish. I swim further. I say, whoa, there's a net. So I swim to the side, get the net, and I begin to pull the net in a circle right in this thing. That's in my dream. And I bring it, I bring it in. And I bring it to the side. And something say, look again. And I look in and I saw just thousands of fish. And I pull it in and I see thousands of fish and then I then I begin to get fearful that they're gonna get out and, and then I begin to realize okay this is this is too big for me this thing become completely too big yeah. for me I can't control this anymore and I let go of the net and, and I woke up out of my dream and the presence of God was in there. Yeah. And I say what was that? And he said to me Peter what is the opposite of fear? And I said love. He said it's the only way that you can keep the fish by love. Love that you know I love you, that it doesn't matter how big it gets, my love for you and the fact that you are inseparable from my love, you will always know that I back you and I help you. Praise God. And your love for the people. And it just touches me. See God, if you go in the night to bed, Say to him, speak to me in a dream, Lord. He will. Maybe the first night not. Who cares? Maybe you ate too much pizza. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it, 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 you know there's, it, there's a brother in our church. For about two years, he said to me, Pastor, I can't see visions. But I'm going to keep on, keep on, keep on until I see a vision. And eventually he began to see visions. His eyes open up to the spirit world. Amen. Remember Peter go to the Gentiles. How did he go to the Gentiles? A vision <laughs> from heaven. So did that encourage you? Tomorrow night we're going to do it different. Amen. It's going to be awesome. So if you want to, we can stand. Did I preach too long? No. no.